Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Hi, Barbara. What will you do this weekend? Well, I'd like to do some shopping, but I have no idea where to go. I've only been here a few days. I was told London is an expensive place to live. Yes, but that's not completely true. London can be an expensive place to live, but if you shop in the right places, you can live relatively cheaply. Is that true? Could you tell me something about the shops? All right. You know food tends to be the cheapest in big supermarkets like Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Most of them have quite a good variety of food and household items. You can buy your fruit and vegetables on the street. You will find these street markets in almost every part of London. You can also buy clothes, shoes and household items in these markets for a real bargain. Have you got a market list provided by the Student Union? Yes, here you are. This might give you some ideas. Let me see. East Street SE17. This market sells cheap food, clothes and hardware. It's open from 8am to 5pm. Yes, but how can I get there? Uh, you can take the underground. We call it Tube. You see, there is a Tube station on the list. Let me see. Yes, it's Castle Station. Right. You can get off at the castle. Good. Look at Leather Lane WC1. Yes, that's a good central London market for clothes, food and hardware. It's open at lunch times from Monday to Friday. It's near Chancery Lane Station. Well, what about the one in Petticoat Lane? Ah, oh, Petticoat Lane, E1. It sells clothes, shoes and household goods. It opens only on Sunday mornings from 9am to 12 at noon. Yes, we can get off at Aldgate Station. What about the one in Walthamstow, E17? Oh, that's a big market for clothes and food. It's open from 9am to 4pm, on Mondays to Saturdays, except Wednesdays and Sundays. Let me see. Yes, we can get there on the central line. What about Brixton? That's Brixton SW9. It's an indoor and outdoor market with a lively atmosphere. It sells vegetables from all over the world. It opens from 9am to 6pm on Mondays to Sundays and half day on Wednesdays. Oh, it's close to Brixton Station. Very near my place. Great. It's very convenient. Tell me more details about Camden Lock. Yes. There are several markets on Camden High Street. And plenty of shops. They sell fashion clothes, jewellery, recorders and pottery. The most famous one is Camden High Street, NW1. It's good for buying presents. Very close to Chalk Farm and Camden Town Station. I see. It says it opens on Sundays, only from 8am to 5pm. Well, I think these markets might help to keep my costs down. Well, if you need to buy new electrical goods or large household items, you can wait until the January sales when all shops sell goods at discounted prices. Thank you so much for your help, Tom. Should we go to Brixton together this weekend? I'd love to. Oh, I'm afraid I've got to go to a lecture. I'll ring you tonight. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Four oh one oh sixty five. Hello, is that you, Tom? Hi, Barbara. Have you decided where to go tomorrow? Yes. I'd like to go to Camden Town to shop. 
Would you like to go there with me? Yes, I'd love to. That's a good market. Mary's here with me now. She wants to go there too. Shall we meet at Camden Town Station? Okay. How are you going there? I will go there by bus. It's only three stops from my place. Well, we might walk there if the weather's fine. How will you get there? I think I'll have to take the underground. I'm at Bond Street, and I'll take the central line first and get off at Tottenham Court Road. Okay. Take the central line and get off at Tottenham Court Road. Then you want the northern line to Camden Town. It's only about four stops. Make sure you get a northbound train, though. You want northbound Camden Town, okay? Okay. I think I can find the way. I have an underground map with me now. What time shall we meet tomorrow? How about one hour earlier, say nine thirty? Fine. That will be all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio program. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome, and indeed welcome, every Friday afternoon at two fifteen to Postbag. Your chance as listeners to let us know what you think about our program and current issues. This week, our Postbag has been virtually overflowing. Not that we're complaining, mind you. Many of you, in fact, a staggering four thousand three hundred seventy-three of you, to be precise, have completed Radio South's listener phone-in survey. Some general points. Eighty-three percent of you think that the radio station has improved over the past year, and only seven percent that it has got worse. Most of you think that the radio station provides an excellent service. That's a big thumbs up for Radio South. Some more statistics: a rather disappointing sixty-four percent of you did not like the start of the new international radio soap that began on Wednesday evenings last month. Many of you said that it was too vulgar and puerile, with no plot. No excitement, and only seventeen percent said that they liked it. We passed on your messages to the producer, and he said that he had received a number of letters and countless phone calls, saying how innovative and modern the plot was. In fact, the figures for those listening had more than doubled for the second program. We'll have to wait and see how this one develops. And for eighty-seven percent of you. The new starting time of 5 a.m. for the wake-up show went down really well. Only a small disapproval rating for this one. In fact, only three percent. Many of you said the earlier time is a real hit. Unfortunately, the wine show has not gone down well at all. It had a 15 percent approval rating and 25 percent who did not like it, and 60 percent who didn't know. Sadly, the main comment was that the program is downright boring. Maybe wine is going out of fashion. The full survey will be published next month, and it is free on request. And now to our weekly letters slot. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Sharon from Tasmania has written in to say that she has tried to get through on the telephone to our new message line, 
to leave a message on the voice box, but she finds it too complicated. She says, and I quote, Every time I press a number after the main menu, the line won't accept my message. It is so frustrating. Maybe your voice box should come with a health warning. Well, I can't tell you that you're not the first person to have complained about this. In fact, we had 67 letters this past week alone, and complaints have been going up at the rate of 10% a week recently, and we're now looking into the problem. On a more cheerful note, Mary from Sydney, Australia, wrote in to say how refreshing and cheerful she found our station was. She says the music and the morning wake-up show she finds really invigorating. We've had lots of similar letters from all around Southeast Asia saying the same thing. From Terry in Auckland, New Zealand. Yuko in Japan and Ahmed in Indonesia. Robin in Australia says it's really an excellent new contribution to the radio scene in the area and encourages us to keep going. Thank you, Robin, for your support. Pangaporn from Thailand wants to know if there are any plans to repeat the English language programme, English Worldwide, on Sunday morning at 9am, or whether we're going to expand the programme. We've had so many letters over the past weeks. The number of people tuning in has grown tenfold. There are no plans at the moment to increase the two-hour slot on Friday morning, but if numbers keep increasing at the rate they are, we may have to. Many of you have asked when we are becoming a 24-hour service. The answer is as soon as we can. We now broadcast 19 hours a day and hope to be on air 24 hours a day within the next six months. And now it's over to Marco, who's going to look at the latest cinema and video releases. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a college tutor and a student about writing a book review. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Oh, hello. Can you spare me a few minutes, please? Yes, of course, Rachel. What can I do for you? It's about the book review you've asked us to write as part of the academic writing course. You said we should ask if we didn't know how to set about it. OK. Well, sit down and let's talk about it. I presume you've chosen the book you want to write about? Yes. Good. Then have a look at this outline. If we talk it through and you make notes on it, It'll help you to structure your review. Right, first of all, what's the name of the book? The Human Mind. Ah, yes, by Robert Winston. It was tied in with a very good television series, wasn't it? So you should start your review with the title and author. The next question is, what character would you put it in? For example, fiction, history, math? Well, I suppose it's science. Can you limit the field a little? How about popular science? Yes, I think that's more helpful. Then I suppose the subject area is the brain. OK. And it's important to mention the intended readership, because you can't judge how effective a book is without considering who it's meant for. Well, it doesn't assume you know a lot about the subject, so I say it's for non-specialists. It was promoted in general bookshops. Right. Now the overview. What would you say Winston is trying to do? Uh, it's very informative, but I think he's also telling us how to make the most of our brains. Then you should briefly discuss the main topics. I'd recommend mentioning the ones that you found the most significant and interesting. Well, it starts by looking back at the last few thousand years and looks briefly at some of the theories that have been developed about the brain, 
and about its importance. It wasn't always considered as important as we now believe. True. And the next topic? I think it should be the structure and activities of the brain that make it function. I found that chapter very interesting, but it was probably the hardest to understand. Hmm. I'd probably agree with you. Any more topics you want to mention? Oh, it covers so much, like the emotions, memory. But I think the role of the brain in creating personality should be mentioned, because I think that's an important aspect of the book. And then there's advice on how we can use our brains to boost our intelligence. I've already started acting on some of the suggestions. Good luck. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Now let's look at the next section of your review, where you should analyse and evaluate the book. This is the main section where you give your own opinions. This first point is really a question of whether we should take the writer seriously. A musician may be qualified to write about music, but it is not necessary to write about the brain, for instance. Hmm. Winston is a professor at the University of London, and he's done a lot of research in various medical fields. So he's very well qualified to write about this subject. What would you say are the strengths of the book?、Mm, it's a complex subject, but he makes it as accessible as it can be for the general reader. That's partly because he illustrates his points with a lot of stories, both about well-known people like Einstein and from his own life. Okay. Are there any other strengths you want to add? I was glad he included a word list to explain the meanings of medical terms, and I didn't find any weaknesses.、Mm, right. Then that brings us to the conclusion. How would you sum up your overall response to the book? Well, I found it fascinating. I think Winston is quite ambitious in the goal he set himself, but he succeeded in reaching it. Well, there you are. You've got the skeleton of your review. Keep that in front of you while you're reading it up, and it should be fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture on the Clifton Suspension Bridge. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. This is the first of a series of lectures on historic engineering structures. Today we are looking at the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol, which we hope to visit later this term. And I'd like to begin with a brief word about the bridge's history and about bridge building in general. Now, people have been building bridges since prehistoric times. Over the centuries, bridge design has evolved using a variety of engineering techniques, but the objective has always been the same. To get to the other side, one of the most basic types of bridge is the arch, and there's evidence from the Middle East that people knew how to construct arches using stone or brick as early as 3,200 BC. The stone arch had the advantage of being quite simple to build, and it remained the main type of bridge design from Roman times until the early 1700s. 
Another type of bridge with a long history is the suspension bridge, where the road is suspended from cables hanging between towers. The first suspension bridges were simple affairs made of rope and wood, and the earliest recorded examples were constructed around A.D. 550 in China. But rope has limited strength, and it only became possible to build longer bridges when iron became available. The first major iron suspension bridge in Europe, completed in 1826, was the Menai Strait Bridge in Wales. The story of the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol began just three years later, in 1829. At that time, the city authorities wanted to build a bridge over the River Avon. In order to choose the best design, they organised a competition, and the winner, announced in 1831, was an engineer by the name of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Work began the same year. But was almost immediately interrupted when serious riots broke out in the city. As a result, investors lost confidence, and work stopped until 1836. The two supporting piers had been completed by 1843, but unfortunately, at this point, the money ran out, and work on the bridge came to a halt for a second time. Then, in 1851. All the ironwork for the bridge was sold off in order to pay back the creditors, and the project seemed to have reached an end. However, in 1860, there was a stroke of luck when a suspension bridge in London was demolished. That bridge had chains which were almost the same as the ones designed for Clifton, and these chains were available to buy. Events moved quickly after that. Money was raised. And work went ahead again in 1862. The bridge was finally completed amid great celebration two years later in 1864. We'll be examining some of the design features in more detail in the second half of this talk, but just as a footnote to this section, it's worth looking ahead to the future and a couple of proposals for super bridges linking not only riverbanks or even countries. But continents. One of these is for a bridge between Alaska and Siberia, which would be six lanes wide and eighty kilometers long. The water of the Bering Sea beneath is only about fifty meters deep, but the biggest challenge is the extreme cold of the location. This would restrict construction to five months a year and also close the road during winter. There's a different obstacle facing a second proposal: a bridge linking Europe and Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar, and that's the depth of water. Although it's only 28 kilometers across, the water is as deep as 1,500 meters in places. In such deep water, a bridge may not be able to support its own weight, so engineers are considering using bridge structures which have never been attempted before. A third seaway that engineers hope to cross in the near future is the Straits of Messina between the island of Sicily and mainland Italy. Unlike the other two proposals, the Messina Bridge only involves one national government, and the distance is relatively short at two and a half kilometers. So there's a good chance it will be built. In this case, it's just a matter of who will provide the cash. Okay, let's take a break at this point, and then. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.